Welcome to Marsh McLennan's Earnings Conference Call. Today's call is being recorded. Third quarter 2024 financial results and supplemental information were issued earlier this morning. They are available on the company's website at marshmclennan.com. Please note that remarks made today may include forward-looking statements. Forward-looking statements are subject to risks and uncertainties, and a variety of factors may cause actual results to differ materially from those contemplated by such statements. For a more detailed discussion of those factors, please refer to our earnings release for this quarter and to our most recent SEC filings, including our most recent Form 10-K, all of which are available on the Marsh McLennan website. During the call today, we may discuss certain non-GAAP financial measures. For a reconciliation of those measures to the most recently comparable GAAP measures, please refer to the schedule in today's earnings release. If you have a question, please press star 11 on your touchstone phone. If you wish to be removed from the queue, please press star 11 again. If you are using a speakerphone, you may need to pick up the handset before pressing the numbers. Once again, if you have a question, please press star 11 on your touchstone phone. I'll now turn the call over to John Doyle, President and CEO of Marsh McLennan. Good morning, and thank you for joining us to discuss our third quarter results reported earlier today. I'm John Doyle, President and CEO of Marsh McLennan. On the call with me is Mark McGivney, our CFO, and the CEOs of our businesses, Martin South of Marsh, Dean Klesur of Guy Carpenter, Pat Tomlinson of Mercer, and Nick Studer of Oliver Wyman. Also with us this morning for her last quarter as Head of Investor Relations is Sarah DeWitt. We'd like to congratulate Sarah on her new role as Chief Financial Officer of Marsh. Before I get into our results, I'd like to take a moment to comment on Hurricanes Helene and Milton, which have devastated communities in Florida and the Southeast United States. These events are first and foremost a human tragedy, and our thoughts are with all of those impacted by the storms. Our primary concern has been the well-being of our colleagues and their families, as well as our clients, and we are actively working to assist in their recovery. While the ultimate insured loss won't be known for some time, the impact of these storms will be significant. And given their wide paths of destruction and close timing, they will put enormous pressure on resources available for recovery. Both hurricanes also highlight the meaningful disparity between economic loss and insured loss. According to some estimates, Helene may have the largest multiple of economic to insured loss of any U.S. storm. This protection gap imposes a meaningful burden on the economy, makes near-term recovery more challenging, and undercuts resilience. In addition, rising frequency and severity of extreme weather events higher property values, and increased development in cap-prone areas are driving the need for greater protection. We and the insurance industry help communities, businesses, and governments build resilience to manage these perils. But as these storms highlight, there is opportunity to do more through risk mitigation, event preparedness, and alternative solutions such as community-based parametric products. Turning to our results, the third quarter marked another milestone for Marsh McLennan. We continued to perform well across our business, and we were thrilled to announce the acquisition of McGriff Insurance Services. In the quarter, we generated 5% underlying revenue growth, following 10% in the third quarter of last year, reflecting solid execution in RAS and consulting. We grew adjusted operating income 12%, our adjusted operating margin expanded 110 basis points. Adjusted EPS grew 4% or 11%, excluding a discrete tax benefit in the third quarter of last year. And we completed $300 million of share repurchases in the quarter. Turning to McGriff, it is a leading provider of insurance broking and risk management services in the U.S. with approximately $1.3 billion in revenue. I have long admired McGriff. They have excellent leadership, talented colleagues, and a track record of strong growth. Their deep specialty and industry capabilities will strengthen the value proposition and expand the reach of Marsh McLennan Agency in the vast and growing middle market segment. 
McGriff's client focus, culture of collaboration, and commitment to excellence and integrity mirror our own. Together, McGriff and MMA will create new opportunities for colleagues to be their best and helping them deliver even greater value to clients. The $7.75 billion transaction will be funded by cash on hand and debt financing. We expect to close by year end, subject to regulatory approval. We would also expect the transaction to be modestly accretive to adjusted EPS, excluding amortization in year one, and become more meaningfully accretive in year two and beyond. We have a terrific track record of acquiring and integrating businesses, and we are excited to welcome McGriff's over 3,500 colleagues to the company when the deal closes. McGriff has added to what is already an active year for M&A across our business. We are on track record for the largest M&A year in Marsh McLennan's history, with nearly $10 billion of capital committed to acquisitions year-to-date, including McGriff, Vanguard's U.S. OCIO business, Cardano, Horton, and FBBI. These acquisitions highlight our strategy to deploy capital to faster-growing segments of our business. As we have said before, we consistently focus on delivering in the near term while investing for sustained growth over the long term. Shifting to the macro environment, the overall backdrop remains supportive of growth despite what continues to be a complex and volatile landscape. Central banks have begun a cycle of easing, and consensus views of the likelihood of near-term recession for most major economies are well below where they were coming into the year. We continue to see economic growth across most of our major markets. Inflation remains elevated but declining. Labor markets remain healthy, and the cost of risk in healthcare continue to rise. That said, uncertainty remains with rising geopolitical tensions and continuing conflicts in Ukraine and the Middle East. Clients across the world continue to assess the implications of technology advances and AI, the ever-persistent threat from cyber attacks, supply chain risk, and the impact of increasing frequency and severity of extreme weather events on their businesses. Our talent, expertise, and solutions help clients manage challenges and accelerate opportunities to thrive. So we remain positive in our outlook for growth. We are well positioned and have a track record of performing across economic cycles due to the enduring value we bring to clients and the resilience of our business. Turning to insurance and reinsurance market conditions, the Marsh Global Insurance Market Index was down 1% overall in the third quarter versus flat in the second quarter. Rates in the U.S. and Latin America were up low single digits. Europe was flat. And in the U.K., Asia, and Pacific, rates were down mid-single digits. Global property rates were down 2% versus flat in the second quarter. However, global casualty rates increased 6% with U.S. US excess casualty up approximately 20% in the quarter. Workers' compensation decreased low single digits. Global financial and professional liability rates were down 7%, while cyber decreased 6%. In reinsurance, demand continued to rise, and capacity remained adequate in the quarter. While it is too early to know the ultimate insured losses from Hurricanes Helene and Milton, we expect there to be an impact on 2025 property insurance and reinsurance pricing. Cap bonds, which posted record volume in the first half, remain likely to have elevated issuance activity through year-end, driven by a heavy maturity schedule. And capacity for casualty programs is expected to be adequate despite concerns over the pace of loss-cost inflation. As always, we are helping clients navigate these dynamic market conditions. Now, let me turn to our third quarter financial performance. We generated adjusted EPS of $1.63, which is up 4% from a year ago, or 11%, excluding a $0.10 discrete tax benefit in the third quarter of last year. On an underlying basis, revenue grew 5%. Underlying revenue grew 6% in RIS and 4% in consulting. Marsh was up 7%. Guy Carpenter, 7%. 
Mercer 5%, and Oliver Wyman grew 1%. Overall in the third quarter, adjusted operating income grew 12%, and our adjusted operating margin expanded 110 basis points year over year. For the nine months, consolidated revenue grew 7% on an underlying basis. Adjusted operating income grew 12%, and our adjusted operating margin expanded 110 basis points. Adjusted EPS was $6.93, up 10% from a year ago. Turning to our outlook, we are well positioned for another great year in 2024. We continue to expect mid-single digit or better underlying revenue growth, another year of margin expansion, and strong growth in adjusted EPS. Our outlook assumes current macro conditions persist. However, the environment remains uncertain and the economic backdrop could be materially different than our assumptions. Overall, I'm pleased with our third quarter performance, which demonstrates execution of our strategy and continued momentum across our business. I'm grateful to our colleagues for their focus and determination, and they value the value they deliver to our clients, shareholders, and communities. With that, let me turn it over to Mark for a more detailed review of our results. Thank you, John, and good morning. Our momentum continued in the third quarter with solid underlying revenue growth, significant margin expansion, and 4% growth in adjusted EPS, or 11%, excluding a large discrete tax benefit last year. Our consolidated revenue increased 6% to $5.7 billion, with underlying growth of 5%. Operating income was $1.1 billion, and adjusted operating income was $1.2 billion, up 12%. Our adjusted operating margin increased 110 basis points to 22.4%. Gap EPS was $1.51. Adjusted EPS was $1.63. For the first nine months, underlying revenue growth was 7%. Adjusted operating income grew 12% to $4.9 billion. Our adjusted operating margin increased 110 basis points to 28%. An adjusted EPS increased 10% to $6.93. Looking at risk and insurance services, third quarter revenue was $3.5 billion, up 8% from a year ago, or 6% on an underlying basis. This result marks the 15th consecutive quarter of 6% or higher underlying growth in RIS and continues the best stretch of growth in two decades. Note that fiduciary income was $138 million in the quarter. In looking ahead to the fourth quarter, we expect to see this amount decline by approximately $30 million, reflecting recent rate cuts and a seasonal drop in fiduciary assets. Operating income in RIS increased 15% to $733 million. Adjusted operating income increased 16% to $775 million, and our adjusted operating margin expanded 130 basis points to 24.7%. For the first nine months, revenue in RIS was $11.7 billion, with underlying growth of 8%. Adjusted operating income increased 12% to $3.7 billion, and the margin increased 100 basis points to 33.6%. At Marsh, revenue in the quarter was $2.9 billion, up 9% from a year ago, or 7% on an underlying basis. This comes on top of 8% growth in the third quarter of last year. Growth in the third quarter was broad-based and reflected solid retention and new business growth. In U.S. and Canada, underlying growth was 6% for the quarter, led by strong growth in MMA and in Victor, our MGA business. In international, underlying growth was 7% and comes on top of 10% in the third quarter of last year. Latin America was up 8%, EMEA was up 7%, and Asia Pacific was up 5%. For the first nine months of the year, Marsh's revenue was $9.2 billion with underlying growth of 7%. U.S. and Canada grew 7%, and international was up 7%. Guy Carpenter's revenue is $381 million in the quarter, up 6% or 7% on an underlying basis, driven by strong growth in international, including global specialties. For the first nine months of the year, Guy Carpenter generated $2.2 billion of revenue and 8% underlying growth. In the consulting segment, third quarter revenue was $2.3 billion, up 3% from a year ago or 4% on an underlying basis. 
Consulting operating income was $462 million, and adjusted operating income was $478 million, up 7%. Our adjusted operating margin in consulting was 21.7% in the third quarter, an increase of 90 basis points. For the first nine months, consulting revenue was $6.7 billion, with underlying growth of 5%. Adjusted operating income increased 7% to $1.3 billion, and our adjusted operating margin increased 60 basis points to 20.7%. Mercer's revenue was $1.5 billion in the quarter, up 5% on an underlying basis. This was Mercer's 14th consecutive quarter of 5% or higher underlying growth. Health underlying growth remained strong at 8% and reflected growth across all regions. Career grew 5%, where we saw strong growth in rewards and talent strategy. Wealth grew 4%, driven by continued demand and defined benefits consulting and growth and investment management. Our assets under management at the end of the third quarter rose to $548 billion, up significantly from the third quarter of last year and up 11% sequentially. Year-over-year growth was driven by the impact of capital markets, our transaction with Vanguard, and positive net flows. For the first nine months of the year, revenue at Mercer was $4.3 billion with 6% underlying growth. Oliver Wyman's revenue in the quarter was $810 million, up 1% on an underlying basis. This reflects a tough comparison to 12% growth in the third quarter of last year and softness in certain geographies. We currently see this trend extending into the fourth quarter. For the first nine months of the year, revenue at Oliver Wyman was $2.4 billion, an increase of 5% on an underlying basis. Foreign exchange had very little impact on earnings in the third quarter. Assuming exchange rates remain at current levels, we also expect minimal FX impact in the fourth quarter. Total noteworthy items in the quarter were $78 million. These included 54 million of restructuring costs, mostly related to the program we began in the fourth quarter of 2022, as well as some transaction-related charges. Our other net benefit credit was 68 million in the quarter. For the full year 2024, we expect our other net benefit credit will be about 270 million. Interest expense in the third quarter was 154 million, up from 145 million in the third quarter of 2023, reflecting higher levels of debt and higher interest rates. Based on our current forecast, we expect approximately $151 million of interest expense in the fourth quarter, excluding any amounts related to the McGriff transaction. Our adjusted effective tax rate in the third quarter was 26.7% compared with 20.5% in the third quarter of last year. Our tax rate last year included the release of evaluation allowance on foreign deferred tax assets. Excluding discrete items, our adjusted effective tax rate was approximately 26.5%. When we give forward guidance around our tax rate, we do not project discrete items which can be positive or negative. Based on the current environment, we expect an adjusted effective tax rate of approximately 26.5% for 2024. Turning to our McGriff transaction, McGriff is a terrific company with excellent leadership, a culture similar to MMAs, a diversified business mix, presence in faster growing U.S. markets, and a strong track record of performance. We will be paying $7.75 billion in cash consideration, funded by a combination of cash on hand and new debt, and we expect to close by year-end subject to regulatory approval. As part of the transaction, we expect to assume a deferred tax asset valued at approximately $500 million. As we've noted in the past, we maintain considerable balance sheet flexibility to position us for this type of opportunity. We've secured a committed bridge loan facility for the full amount of the purchase price and currently plan to replace these commitments with permanent financing in the fourth quarter as we get closer to closing. Based on our outlook today, we expect to raise $7.25 billion in new debt to fund the transaction. We value our high-quality ratings, and we were pleased that all three rating agencies recently affirmed our current ratings with no changes in outlook. 
The financial and capital management plan contemplated in the transaction is not only consistent with maintaining our current ratings, but we also expect to have meaningful flexibility for capital deployment next year. Although initially our leverage ratios will increase, the substantial cash flow we expect to generate, as well as increased debt capacity through earnings growth, will enable us to bring our leverage ratios back in line with levels necessary to maintain a strong ratings profile. As a result, while we intend to pause share repurchases in the fourth quarter, as we think about capital management into next year, we expect we will maintain our balanced approach that includes increasing our dividend and reducing our share count each year, as well as continuing to fund high-quality acquisitions. We will obviously have more guidance around our outlook for capital deployment in 2025 on our fourth quarter earnings call early next year. As John noted, we expect the transaction will be modestly accretive to adjusted EPS excluding amortization in year one, becoming more meaningfully accretive in year two and beyond. This transaction is a great reflection of several elements of our capital management strategy. Maintaining flexibility to take advantage of opportunities, a bias to reinvest capital for growth, and delivering in the near term while challenging ourselves to invest to sustain growth into the future. Turning to capital management in our balance sheet, we ended the quarter with total debt of $12.8 billion. Our next scheduled debt maturity is in the first quarter of 2025 when $500 million of senior notes mature. We currently expect to deploy approximately $4.2 billion of capital in 2024 across dividends, acquisitions, and share repurchases, excluding the McGriff transaction. Our cash position at the end of the third quarter was $1.8 billion. Uses of cash in the quarter totaled $1.1 billion. It included $404 million for dividends, $435 million for acquisitions, and $300 million for share repurchases. For the first nine months, uses of cash totaled $3.3 billion and included $1.1 billion for dividends, $1.3 billion for acquisitions, and $900 million for share repurchases. I want to spend a minute on our plans to change how we report adjusted EPS. Starting next year, we will exclude the impact of acquisition-related amortization from adjusted EPS. We will also exclude the other net benefit credit, another non-cash item. These changes will improve the comparability of our results and give investors a better sense of our core earnings power. They will also conform our adjusted EPS reporting with how we report adjusted operating margins. While there continues to be uncertainty in the outlook for the global economy, we feel good about the momentum in our business and the current environment remains supportive of growth. Overall, we are well positioned for another great year in 2024. Based on our outlook today, for the full year, we continue to expect mid-single digit or better underlying growth, margin expansion, and strong growth in adjusted EPS. With that, I'm happy to turn it back to John. Thank you, Mark. Andrew, we're ready to begin Q&A. Certainly. We will now begin the question and answer session. If you have a question, please press star 11 on your touchtone phone. If you wish to be removed from the queue, please press star 11 again. If you are using a speakerphone, you may need to pick up the handset before pressing the numbers. Once again, if you have a question, please press star 11 on your touchtone phone. And in the interest of addressing questions from as many participants as possible, we ask that participants limit themselves to one question and one follow-up question. One moment for our first question. And our first question comes from the line of Elise Greenspan with Wells Fargo. Hi, thanks. Um, Good morning. My first question um, is on the Griff deal. When you guys say, right, that you expect it, um, you know, creative to, you know, earnings, less intangibles, what are your, can you give us some color on what your assumptions are for, um, for revenue growth relative to the $1.3 billion that you're taking on? And then also, what are you assuming for margin? I guess my question is for the year one guide, but any guide you kind of want to give us, you know, for year two and beyond would be helpful as well. Sure, Elise, and, and thank you for the question. I, you know, I just want to reiterate how excited we are to bring Welcome McGriff into the family, you know, obviously subject to regulatory approval. They 
have a really strong culture. It's a competitive group. They're so client focused. You know, I spoke to the talent in my prepared remarks and, you know, they'll extend our reach into, you know, it's a, a vast and fragmented uh, middle market. They have excellent specialty capabilities and industry focus and, you know, working together with MMA, we know they can drive better outcomes for clients and we can create new opportunities um, for their colleagues as well. So, so we're excited about all that. <clears throat> you know, we've shared, you know, the details that we're going to share um, about the business, you know, like other MMA transactions, we don't, um, you know, disclose their margins when we acquire them or, or for that matter, um, you know, how they're growing or, um, but we're, we're excited about it. Um, you know, as I said, it'll be modestly accretive in year one. Um, and more so um, after that. And, you know, we expect to earn a good return um, on the investment um, over time. So um, there are synergies, of course, but uh, um, we're conservative in our modeling and, and uh, we're very excited about what the combination can mean. Thanks. And then my follow-up on U.S. and Canada, you know, growth was you know, 6% again um, this quarter. Can you just give us a sense of some of the dynamics that you're seeing within within that market? And then relative to, like, the IPO and SPAC in that business, right, that's been a headwind, um, you know, for a couple years, have you seen any any improvement um, there in the quarter? I'm sure. You know, I'd, I'd start at least just with, you know, overall, I'm, I'm very pleased with our, our underlying growth in the quarter. I thought we had a, a, a terrific quarter. Marsh, Guy Carpenter, and Mercer all had, um, you know, terrific growth. Um, and it was really, um, you know, widespread. You know, it was across all regions and practices. And so um, I felt good about that. We obviously had a softer uh, quarter of growth at, at Oliver Wyman. But uh, um, but overall, I thought the, the growth was good and, and we're well positioned. You know, I spoke to the macro environment. It is shifting and changing. And, you know, obviously interest rates have begun to come down um, in some major economies around the world. And, you know, that's meant um, some new opportunity. Um in uh, you know in SPACs and IPOs and well maybe not SPACs but um, but IPOs and uh, and M and A activity were starting to uh, pick up a bit but uh, Martin maybe you could talk a little bit about um, the U S marketplace and some of the opportunities we're seeing. Sure, John. Well, thank you. As uh, as you said, very pleased with uh, underlying growth of seven percent, which is kind of in line with eight uh, percent in three Q twenty three and three Q twenty two. Very good balance of growth uh, across international and in the U S. But I'll. I'll, I'll double click a little bit on the US. Uh, performed very well, six on top of six in, in, in Q3. Uh, we saw very good growth from MMA and Victor. Uh, and to Lisa's question, we did see double digit growth in the capital markets and MA products. Uh, construction, aviation performed well. Uh, and globally, you know, very strong growth in our, in our benefits business as well. So overall, pleased with that. Good momentum. Um, and, uh, you know, expect that to continue. The double-digit growth, uh, at least in capital markets, of course, is off a lower base, right after after a couple of years of uh, you know of a soft environment there. So, uh, thank you for your questions, uh, Andrew. Next question, please. Absolutely. Our next question comes from the line of Jimmy Bueller with J.P. Morgan. Hey, good morning. Um, so, first, just had a question um, uh, following up on your comments on Milton and its impact on the market. So, just specifically on reinsurance, um, just wondering what your expectations are on how Milton affects renewals, and should one assume that prices could actually go up or they're just going to go down less um, uh, given the high loss? Yeah, I think Jimmy. At the end of the day, it's it's uh, it's too early to know that you know at this point. Um, you know, there's obviously a a range of estimates out there, and and the ranges are are quite wide, um, and so there's still a lot for us to learn. Um, you know, many property owners are are just getting to um, you know to their facilities. You know, at this point, and and so you know, I I, I spoke about the overall economic impact to the southeast and. Um, you know, what it means to those communities, you know, at a human level as well. Um, it's going to be a challenging recovery, um, and it's going to extend for a, um, for a bit of period of time. Um, you know, maybe I, I could ask Dean to comment a little bit about what we're expecting, you know, in advance of those storms and, you know, any thoughts he has on, on the impact it might have. Dean? Yeah, thanks, John. And, uh, you know, Jimmy, as we entered the kind of fall conference season, you know, ahead of, 
Helene and Milton. I think our clients and we anticipated, you know, a very competitive market environment at the upcoming January 1 property cap renewal. I think post-Milton, you know, it's still early, but I think we see a flattening of pricing in the property cap market at the upcoming January 1 renewal. Um, If you think about kind of lower and mid-level layers in programs, we kind of see risk-adjusted flattish at this point without all the data in. And you could still see some softening, some rate reductions in more, you know, remote risk layers and property cap towers. You know, as John said, you know, keep in mind, it's, it's early. We're still in wind season. There could be additional cat events over the next several weeks that would shape the market. And as John noted, you know, it'll be several weeks before we have sufficient claims data to make accurate loss estimates and those impacts on our clients. And right now, we're just relying on all of our cat modeling partners to come up with some of those estimates. But to sum it up, Jiminy, I would say overall, property cat demand should increase at January 1 from our clients. We think capacity in the marketplace will be adequate. We think the renewal will be manageable for most of our clients. You know, the market is well capitalized to trade forward and meet client demand. And keep in mind, I think the headline, Jimmy, is the major of the cat losses this year will be borne by our clients, given the high attachment points that were imposed on them after Hurricane Ian two years ago. Thank you, Dean. Jimmy, do you have a follow-up? Yeah, just uh, on Oliver Wyman, obviously the comps were tough as well, but um, you noted seeing weakness in some geographic regions. Was that a function of the economy, or um, is there something else that's, caused, uh, that's affecting results in the uh, areas that you mentioned? Yeah, sure. I mean, you know, 1% obviously underlying was softer you know, than we'd uh, uh, planned for. You know, it was a tough comp, and we're up 5% year-to-date. And, you know, what I would also say is, you know, I've mentioned to you in the past, there's going to be more volatility quarter to quarter um, at Oliver Wyman. We do expect higher underlying revenue growth from Oliver Wyman over the medium to long term. But, Nick, maybe you could share some insights on on what you're seeing in the market. Thank you, Jimmy. Um, We often say this is a mid to high single digit business through the cycle, and I think it's fair to say we're at a low point in the cycle. And we've talked for a few quarters now about that being a tough market, and we do see that continuing. Um, maybe at a macro level, I'd just note we're more than 50% larger than we were pre-pandemic. We're two-thirds larger than that pandemic year. And I think we are consolidating those gains in that tough market. Uh, but to the quarter itself, no one likes a one. No one likes a one following a three. Um, they were a 12 and 11 comp. Thank you for noting that in the question. <laughs> uh, when we look at the year as a whole, we're a five. Um, I, I think uh, I do want to note we're on the front foot inorganically as well because there are parts of our business where scale does matter. Um, and so the business is 8% larger than in the same period, uh, first three quarters of last year. Um, and, and that represents a form of progress. We've seen very strong growth in Asia and the Pacific region bouncing back uh, from a tougher period. Um, our India, Middle East, and Africa business continues to grow. The, the regional softness has been more in the Americas and in Europe. Um, I think some of that is linked to the economy, but also just corporate buying habits given uncertainty uh, in the Americas. There may be those in the U.S., particularly some waiting for the election. Um, Sector-wise, our best growth has been in our communications, media, and technology practice, Um, our insurance and asset management practice growing very strongly, Um, automotive and manufacturing doing well, and our large banking practice continuing to be pretty robust. Um, But overall, we we see it as being a, a relatively tough market, which we're continuing to work our way through. Thank you, Jimmy, for your questions. Andrew, next question, please. Our next question comes from the line of Greg Peters with Raymond James. Uh, Good morning. Um, I guess uh, for my first question, uh, I'd like to focus on um, the free cash flow results. Um, I was looking in the statement of cash flows, uh, operating cash flow through the nine months, down a little bit, not growing in line with revenue, and just I'm sure there's some some, uh, puts and takes in there, just some color there would be helpful. 
Yeah, sure, Greg. You know, as we've noted in the past, there's going to be more volatility to free cash flow growth, certainly, than um, our uh, earnings growth. But, Mark, maybe you could share some some color. Yeah, just I'll, I'll repeat that, John. I, I we Free cash flow is something that, uh, you know, is volatile, volatile quarter to quarter um, and, and year to year. So best looked at over long stretches of time. Our track record in free cash flow growth, as we've noted before, has been terrific. So we're double-digit free cash flow growth for uh, a decade plus. Uh, and that's what you'd expect for a company that's grown its EPS double-digit, um, you know, given our, our high cash generation capital light type, um, type model. There's, really, there's no story in the results uh, year-to-date. So free cash flow is down year-to-date. It was up 28% last year. It was actually up in the third quarter. So what you're seeing year-to-date um, – is uh, you know, it's just a, a number of factors that, that caused this period-to-period volatility. So we had higher variable compensation payouts in the first quarter because of our strong results last year. Receivables are up because of growth and just a little bit of business mix and, and timing. And there's just a, a handful of one-timers in last year's period, this period, uh, this period that, that affect the year-over-year comparisons. So you know, overall, you know, we have a, a, an outlook for continued strong growth in earnings. Um, and therefore, our free cash flow growth into the future should be strong as well. Thanks, Mark. Greg, do you have a follow-up? Uh, yeah, uh, Mark. In your in your comments, I think you mentioned something about fiduciary income and interest income, and you provided some guidance. And I'm wondering if you could just your your guys are flying through so many comments. If you could just revisit those comments and sort of, I think you're you're framing it for fourth quarter. And if we could push it out and, you know, sort of frame it for next year or two for us, it would be helpful. Yeah, sure. I, let me repeat what I, uh, what I said. I, we, we did have a lot in the, uh, in the script this quarter. So, so we just wanted to flag that as we look into the fourth quarter, we, we typically see, especially in Guy Carpenter, just given the, the seasonality of, of their revenue with so much activity in the first half, we do see fiduciary balances that tend to fall off in the fourth quarter. So we do expect fiduciary income to be 30 million or so lower in the fourth quarter from the level we saw in the third quarter. And it's a combination of the rate cuts that have happened um, and the impact that they will have, as well as this seasonal drop in fiduciary balances. You know, we look out to 2025, uh, it, it's really going to depend on what rate actions happen from here, what happens in the balance of this year, what happens in the next year. And so we're, we're going to stay away from, you know, speculating there. But, but just to repeat some of the things we've said in the past, the, the math is pretty straightforward. So we've got roughly $11.5 billion of balances on average these days. Um, and so you can use that as a basis to try to um, – do some sensitivity analysis around what that could mean to fiduciary income. There would be some offsets. You know, there, there, are, there is some interplay in, uh, with some of our variable compensation programs. We obviously would pay less in terms of interest on short-term debt. Um, but we'll just have to wait and see what happens with, with uh, further cuts as we look into next year. You know, Greg, I would, I would just add, you know, we're accustomed to operating in a lower Great environment, so you know we'll adjust our you know our plans accordingly. It, it you know will likely be an increasing headwind for us into uh, into 2025, and we model out the various scenarios, not just from this headwind, but from other headwinds as well. And so you know we we make plans um, accordingly. But a lower rate environment, you know, could also you know imp- or likely will impact other parts of our business as well. You know, we we touched on the increasing transaction risk, um, you know, as a result of uh, Higher uh, volume in, in M&A markets, IPOs, construction, Mercer Wealth, of course. Overall, our cost of capital, um, you know, will be impacted as well. So there'll be lots of ins and outs um, from a lower uh, rate environment, and um, we're working it, our way through um, all those issues. Thank you, Greg. Andrew, next question. Our next question comes from the line of Mike Zaremski with BMO Capital Markets. Hey, um, good morning. Thanks. Um, first question on the um, thanks for the update on the Marsh um, pricing index, uh, which moved to, to negative one territory, I believe. Um, can you um, help tease out how this um, index and kind of pricing in this marketplace is, is having an impact on on Marsh's organic growth? I know that you know there's an element of fees and then commissions as well. But is this, is the index, as it's decelerated in the last year or so, has it had any material impact on your uh, Marsh's rate of organic growth? 
Well, look, um, you know, first of all, Mike, what I would say is that, um, you know, the markets overall on average are, are stable. Um, insurers have picked up quite a bit of price over the course of the last several years. So, you know, a, a minus one was, you know, some welcome relief, at least um, for many of our clients at, uh, you know, at March um, after what's been a tough pricing environment. Of course, price is ultimately a reflection of the cost of risk over time. And so, you know, as I mentioned in my in my prepared remarks, the cost of risk um, continues to uh, um, to escalate. Um, about half of our business at Marsh is is uh, sensitive to um, our revenue. That is is sensitive to PNC pricing through commission. Um, the rest of it, of course, is uh, um, is on a fee, um, and it's not a direct line. You, you know, you have direct. You know, you have buying habits. Um, you know, changes. Markets soften a bit, and um, the risk environment changes. You may have clients um, retain less risk than they had over the course of the last few years. We've talked. Um, on prior calls, for example, about the growth in our captives business, the premium um, and the captives that we manage have been growing faster than the premiums that we seed into the marketplace. Um, you know, if the market continues to get a bit more competitive, that that may change. So, obviously, it has an impact, um, but it's not a straight line from you know from price. What I would also point out to you is that our index is skewed to large accounts, um, and that the middle market um, pricing um, is more stable, and it's up. Um, low to mid single digits. I hope that's helpful. You have a follow up, yeah, Mike? Yeah, quick follow up. I'll I'll stick with um your pricing commentary. Hopefully, other people ask about Mercer Health being strong. But um, so U.S. Excess, I believe you said was plus twenty. Um, that's a pretty big number. Um, maybe you can talk about it. Whether you know there's dislocation in that marketplace, or you know what's going on. Is there going to be moves to the ENS market, or maybe that's not even an ENS. Um, you know, uh, maybe just anything, any color you could add that seems like it's a uh, a number that's distressed uh, for certain some of your clients. Yeah, I'm sure, Mike. I on, on the last call, in fact, I I talked about you know some real troubling signs in the U.S. liability market. Um, maybe I'll ask Martin to share some insights on you know what we're seeing in in that marketplace. Yeah, yeah. Thank you, John. That uh, you know. I'll just start with a comment that overall the, the composite rating index is up about one and a half times since 20, uh, 2012. The casualty book is, is up 6% in North America with the excess book up 21%. Um, at, at the moment, we're not seeing dislocations in that the capacity that clients are requesting we can place. Uh, there are smaller limits that, that uh, insurers have and we're doing jobs to, to think what we can do to place quota share pr- uh, programs for our clients uh, to avoid compression of limits. Um, and uh, so we we don't see anything too sinister in terms of supply for clients at this point. Um, certainly there's been a movement to the ENS market and we're, we're big players in that space. Uh, and, and that segment of the market has grown significantly. Um, you know, there's more agility and rate movement in, in those areas there. So uh, we're well positioned to help them with that, uh, and we'll be continuing to, continue to work with them as, as our clients deal with some of the social inflation that we've talked about in the past uh, as well. So lots of other services that we need to, uh, to wrap around that to help our clients navigate this market. Thank you, Mike, and thank you, Martin. Andrew, next question, please. Our next question comes from the line of Brian Meredith with UBS. Yeah, thank you. Um, First one for Dean on the reinsurance side. You mentioned that um, you expect ample capacity in the Casley lines. I'm just curious, can you maybe talk a little bit about how are the reinsurers, do you think, going to be reacting to this tort inflation um, that we continue to see in the marketplace at 1-1? Do you think we'll see a lot of tightening in terms and conditions? You know, what are you hearing? What are you seeing from them? Yeah, thanks, Brian. I'll, I'll hand it to Dean in a second. But um, you know, loss cost inflation in casualty lines remains a, a real um, a real challenge for the marketplace overall. And you know, we're we're concerned about it from our clients' perspective. Um, and uh, you know, was the talk of, of conference season, I think, um, in advance of Helene and Milton. So you know, Dean, maybe you could share some thoughts on on what you're seeing in reinsurance casualty. Yeah, thanks, John. You know, Brian, as, as John said, I think. You know, reinsurers generally continue to express great concern about the U.S. casualty reinsurance market, focused in particular 
on excess casualty as noted by by John and Martin for all the factors we've been discussing. You know, th- that said, as we head to the 1-1 renewal season, you know, we think current market conditions will largely prevail in the casualty market at 1-1. Um, you know, that said, we continue to see downward pressure on seating commissions for quota share deals, you know, averaging 100 basis points, you know, therefore, you know, that that's a rate increase. Um, Excess of loss contracts, you know, more robust rate increases in the five to 25 percent range, and maybe stru- may- many structural changes to get those deals across the line. You know, we do expect adequate, you know, capacity in the marketplace, maybe more limited for XOL deals. Um, you know, thus far, you know, these deals are challenging, but they're getting done. They're getting across the line in the marketplace. And I really think the key for our clients, as, as Martin and John have said, is going to be the, the performance of their underlying portfolios. Are they getting underlying rate increases in their books? Are they managing limits and excess casualty in other lines? That will be the, you know, the, the key formula for successful renewal. But you know, casualty is challenging right now in the market, but we think it's stable and most deals will get done. So clear signs of lost cost inflation, lost development patterns disrupted by, you know, the impact of the economy and closing of courts and during the pandemic and then, you know, kind of the economic rebound. So it's, uh, you know, it's challenging for all of us to uh, to get our arms around it. And we're obviously doing our best to help clients navigate um, the uncertainty around it. Brian, do you have a follow up? Yeah, absolutely, John. And I know we've talked about this before, but uh, maybe just your perspective on the the business continuing to flow to the non-admitted market. Do you think that's slowing here? And then also, you know, how can Marsh kind of react to that to mitigate that or maybe recapture share? And does McGriff have anything, you know, that could potentially help you benefit benefit you in the non-admitted area? Well, I, I to be clear, we're not losing share as a result of uh, you know the growth in the ENS market um, in the United States, um, you know, you're seeing, um, you have seen and observed outsized growth in um, wholesale broking, you know, as a, as a result of that. But we have access to those markets um, and we'll access um, that capital if it's the right um, the right solution for our clients. Generally, we prefer admitted solutions for our clients given, you know, kind of what comes with um you know, with uh, being an admitted insurer. So, you know, our strategy is about accessing as much of the market directly, including ENS um, insurers as possible. And um, overwhelmingly, the ENS premium that we place into the market today, we do directly um, today, right? So um, to be clear, you know, in in terms of market growth, future market growth, you know, it's hard to say, but you know, and I certainly understand in this dynamic risk environment, certainly multi-channel insurers that have both admitted and non-admitted, why they want um, to use more non-admitted solutions. It gives it gives them more flexibility um, to to react more quickly to you know to the changing risk environment. So so I understand that. Again, our focus is you know is is accessing capital as directly as possible and as efficiently as possible so we can continue to drive the best solutions for you know for uh, for our clients we'll continue to use wholesale brokers but you know for niche expertise where um they serve us and our and our client well so um so anyway that's that's really um how we see it Brian Andrew next question please our next question comes from the line of Grace Carter with Bank of America. Hi, everyone. Um, I was hoping to ask a couple of cleanup questions regarding McGriff. Um, is there any possibility that y'all might give us some of the below-the-line impacts, like how much you're thinking uh, amortization might increase um, associated with the deal and any sort of transaction or integration expenses that we should expect over the next few quarters? Thanks. Um, good morning, Grace, and, and thanks for the question. No, we're not um, prepared to do that. Um, you know, as I said, um, it's a typical MMA um, transaction, so you know we haven't disclosed margins or the underlying performance of the businesses. Other than that, I will say um, we're very impressed with the performance of, of McGriff. It's had strong underlying revenue growth. Its sales velocity um, is, is quite strong as well. You know, very similar to to the performance of MMA. 
Thanks. And I guess on the, the tax rate, I know it's a bit early to be looking at next year, but just kind of considering how um, the geographic mix of the business might um, be impacted by the deal. I mean, is kind of the 25 to 26.5 original guide for this year still kind of fair to assume? And while we're on the subject of tax, if you could help us um, maybe think about the timeline for utilizing the, the DTA that you're getting. Well, we're not going to guide to uh 2025, we'll talk about that in January on the call. So, um, Mark, anything you know else to, to share on tax overall? Uh, just to your question on the deferred tax assets. So the value I talked about is the present value of the future tax deduction stream that we affect. And that, that, that is going to go out over a long period of time. Thank you. Thank you, Grace. Andrew, next question, please. Certainly. Our next question comes from the line of Rob Cox with Goldman Sachs. Hey, thanks. Uh, appreciate that it's the largest M&A year in MMC's history. I'm curious if the price you're paying for top 100 brokers has changed your thought process at all on relative capital deployment across the different avenues. Um. You know, look, we've uh, talked about our approach to capital management. Um, We favor investing um, in the business over, you know, over buybacks. You know, we, as you know, aspire to be a, to raise our dividend um, each and every year as well. Um, You know, we have a responsibility, obviously, to be good stewards of our capital. So, you know, we are, although multiples have increased over the course of the last several years, um, you know, we have a great confidence in our ability to earn a return well in excess of our of our cost of capital. And so um, should that change or should we see a deal that, um, you know, um, doesn't uh, accomplish those objectives, we'll, we'll deploy capital elsewhere. But uh, we have a very strong reputation as a buyer in the marketplace. Um, we, uh, we spend a lot of time you know, game planning various scenarios from small to uh, mid-sized kind of tuck-in store business to, um, you know, to more material deals, you know, like McGriff, and we're very well positioned in that marketplace. Mark talked about, um, you know, even after McGriff, we maintain um, a lot of flexibility um, if we see the opportunity to make not make ourselves not just bigger but better um, as a business going forward. Um, so that's our approach. You have a follow-up, Rob? Yeah, thanks, John. Um, Yeah, I just wanted to ask a question on something that I feel like doesn't get a lot of airtime, but I was hoping to get an update on the commission rates and and fee rates in the the brokerage operations. Is there anything you can tell us about how these take rates have changed uh, over the course of the hard market in recent years? And if not, what's driving the stability? So... um I, I, I actually I don't view the last several years as a hard market, right? Just to um, start with that, um, you know, I thought you know what we observed as challenging it was for our retail clients um, at Marsh was was largely kind of a catch up period um, for insurers on average to you know to catch up with uh, accelerating loss costs. It's not to say certain markets in a you know in a shorter period of time you know weren't weren't challenging, you know, for example when ransomware um, picked up in in the cyber market and um, the underwriting community have not really priced for that kind of risk, um, you know, the market jumped pretty quickly, but then it settled quite quickly as well. And, um, and in fact, um, you know, the market's coming back in favor of our retail clients um, a bit at the, at the moment. So, so I, I would start with that. But over a, a fairly long, um, extended period of time, our, our average commission rates um, at Marsh have, have remained fairly, uh, fairly stable. Um, from product line to product line, you know, there's, you know, there's some movement, um, but, uh, but for the most part, um, average acquisition expense um, through, uh, um, through Marsh has been um, pretty constant. Thank you, Rob, for your questions. Andrew, another question, please. Yes, our next question comes from the line of Andrew Kliegerman with Katie Cowan. Excellent. I made it. Thanks for taking my questions. Um, <laughs> John, and, John and Mark, um, you know, it, your, your, your underlying growth in RIS is, you know, nothing shy of outstanding. 
And we looked last year at, you know, double-digit uh, underlying growth this year. And it, it's kind of decelerated down to 6%, which is still excellent. But the question for you going forward, and I, I know you guide to mid-single digit or better underlying growth across businesses. So what, what kind of gives you the confidence that it, it kind of holds in this kind of six zone, maybe, maybe even slightly less, and, and doesn't decelerate further? You know, thank Andrew. Thank you, Andrew. We always have time for you, Andrew. Just to be, um, just to be clear. Thank you. <laughs> um, <laughs> um, you know, look as I mentioned in our, in, in my prepared remarks. Um, you know, the macro environment remains um, supportive of growth overall. Uh oh, we're having a, a fire alarm here. Sorry. Um, we'll, we'll check. We'll check in on that. But I'll, I'll try to um, push through it. Hopefully, everybody can, um, can hear us. But, um, but. Uh, you know, we're in this elevated risk environment, you know, geopolitical risk, uh, frequency and severity of weather, cyber events, loss cost inflation, um, all of those things, um, you know, creating um, opportunities for us to, uh, to help clients. And, you know, pricing's moderated, um, but markets have been disciplined um, overall. And we've been very focused on building and adding to our capabilities, right? Um, and, you know, McGriff's kind of the latest example of that. We're investing organically and inorganically. We've been reshaping the mix of our business over time, right? So um, McGriff, and another example of deploying capital into the faster-growing uh, middle market. Um, I would also note that we're working together better than we ever have um, as well. That's driving some real um, growth opportunities um, for us as well. So, again, we'll guide, you know, around 2025 in, in January. Um, but I feel like we're executing well um, and in this elevated um, risk environment. Um, there's real opportunities for us to continue to, um, to drive good growth in our business. Got it. And and, and you just touched on the faster, you know, the faster growth in MMA. Any any color, John, that you could provide around, you know, how much it, it outpaces the large corporate uh, business? Yeah, I mean, we're we're not going to disclose kind of um, segment growth, but it it is higher. It's over time, and by the way, not in every quarter and, and in every year, for that matter. Over the course of the last several years, has it um, outpaced um, you know the up market growth um, at Marsh, but uh, um, but it's been a more consistent um, you know growth um, business for us and. You know, what, what really excites me um, about that marketplace is how we can bring scale benefits to, to clients um, really at a different level. So and I think McGriff's is a great example. It's a terrific business with um, outstanding fundamentals, terrific leadership, um, outstanding talent um, all throughout its business. And we've shown, and as we've um, brought firms into MMA, we can make them even stronger. We can um, bring capabilities from MMA and Marsh to help them better serve clients. So so we are excited about that. So thank you, um, Andrew. I appreciate the questions. And, and Andrew, I think we'll wrap up the call um, at this point, given that we're having a fire alarm in our, <laughs> in our building. Um, so I want to thank you all for joining us on the call. Um, in closing, I want to thank our colleagues for their hard work and dedication. I also want to thank our clients for their continued support. So thank you all, and we look forward to speaking with you again next quarter. Ladies and gentlemen, thank you for participating. This does conclude today's program, and you may now disconnect.